Welcome to Try Babies, the podcast where we're not afraid to be seen trying and crying. You're joined by Sunroom co-founders Michelle Battersby, that's me, and Lucy Mort. That's me. We help build the world's largest dating apps, Bumble and Hinge. Now we're in the thick of building our own tech company and we're bringing you along for the wild ride. Each week you'll hear from us as we fill you in on the good, the bad and the ugly when it comes to business, career, relationships and everything in between. We'll tackle burning audience questions and be joined by inspiring creators, female business leaders and the people who have motivated and energised us along the way. These won't be your typical shiny business stories. We want to showcase the experiences that go unsaid and definitely chat about the moments that don't make it onto Instagram. Prepare to hear about the lows, the failures, the doubt and the downright nightmare days. Navigating life through your 20s and 30s can be hard, which is why we're so passionate about creating a space for you to come to on the days you need to feel seen, inspired, educated, supported, and sometimes shocked into action. This is honestly the podcast we both needed throughout our journeys. In today's episode, we dive deeper into our CEO, Lucy's story, from growing up on a farm in Mudgee to being the lead designer at Hinge in New York City. Strap in, this is episode one of Try Babies. Lucy, it is our first episode. I am pumped to get into your story. I feel like the world needs to know it. So for this episode, we'll just go back to the very start. Give everyone a bit of context. So (laughs) tell everyone, where did you grow up? So I grew up in a little town called Mudgee, which is like three and a half hours northwest of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, I grew up on a farm. My dad runs a sheep farm. He breeds merino sheep uh, and runs cattle as well. And my mom is a primary school teacher. So I feel like I had a pretty rare upbringing. (laughs) Yep. Uh, We didn't have a TV for like the first 10 years of my life. Just like lots of time outside. Really? So no, like you didn't watch Johnson and Friends? No. (laughs) Noddy. (laughs) Like, I know some of these classics because my grandparents had a TV. Yeah. And so, like, if I ever walked over to their house, they also had a house on the same property that we lived on. Okay. Um, I would get to see some of these shows. Okay. So, it wasn't like I was totally deprived. Yeah. But, like, looking back, I feel weirdly grateful for that deprivation. Yeah. Just because we spent so much time outside. What was the main thing you can remember doing as a child? Like, your favourite activity? Uh, honestly, like crafts, like on, making things, making little wooden boats with my brothers that we'd go and like race down the creek. Or I had this epic craft book that had like, you know, a hundred different things you could make. And every weekend I would just like pick off one or two of these things and just make them. So just a lot of like, yeah, like finding old scraps, building tree houses, like a lot of generating and crafts and art. You have two younger brothers, Yeah. Yeah. What's your relationship like with them as the oldest, like as the oldest daughter? How did you interact with them? Were they your slaves? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, so like Tim and I, we played a lot together because we were really close in age. Um, They now as adults are really close and they're back in Australia together. And I don't feel like, yeah, quite as involved, but as kids, uh, to be honest, I have to admit to being kind of mean. Like <laughs> Tim and I would definitely fight a lot. I like I was mean to Hamish because he looked different from me and Tim. And, <laughs> and I, I used to say awful things like he was adopted probably. Oh, we've all done I, that. I, I think I really did play the like villain older sister role. Yeah. Um, but we also had a good time and we did lots of stuff together. And we like, yeah, would make up dances to songs or we would like – do little like expeditions through the paddock together. We'd ride our motorbikes together. So there was a lot of like, yeah, camaraderie. Do you think all the outdoor time and all of the craft is what was fostering this creativity in you? Has that just always been a hobby of yours and something you'd go back to? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a little bit recently. Like both my parents are highly, um, like they're producers and they're highly like generative people. Um, my mom is like constantly baking things, making things, sewing things. She sews like a lot of her own clothes. And so, and my dad 
is like constantly like welding, making things around the farm, constructing stuff. So I think I just saw as my role models, these two people who just like loved to create. And I, yeah, it's in me and my brothers. And I think that's probably where it started. It's just like so innate in our upbringing. Did you have any little side hustles or little businesses growing up? <laughs> uh, we would, I mean, we would do jobs for dad around the farm. And like, let me tell you, they were not glamorous jobs because it was a farm. But like, that was the first like couple of ways that we you know, earned money. One of the... <laughs> I mean, two of the most memorable were uh, shoveling up all the sheep shit from underneath the shearing shed into yep. bags. And my my brother, who was probably like the most entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial of us at the time, would like go and sell these bags of poop to old ladies in town who wanted to like their gardens to flourish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious because my dad always says you have to have been a shit kicker at some point in your career <laughs> and you were kicking shit at like what six <laughs> yeah it w- yeah I, I mean, we did start like pretty early I don't know if it was six but like we were driving by age eight what um so that like dad could feed the sheep off the back of the truck and manual. we manual just- yeah. You were driving a but it, manual. But it was like, the you know, step one, the baby steps was he'd just put it into first gear and he'd like let the clutch out for us and we'd just sit there behind the steering wheel, like just having, having to steer. So it was like fairly simple. But then like as we got older, it was like more complex, uh, hardly complex, but like slightly higher skilled jobs that we would do, like helping with shearing, helping sort the wool into like different categories and like taking off the shitty parts of the wool or like the, the grass seed out of the wool. <laughs> And so, yeah, it was. Did you have an idea of what you wanted to be when you were older? Not, okay. So I thought I wanted to be a vet when Mm -hmm. I was a really young kid. I was just surrounded by animals and I was constantly tending to like little puppies and lambs. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a vet. And so that was the vision up until, I don't know, I was probably like 14 or 15 Um, and then I think I went through a a phase of, of not really knowing, uh, career counselors, like tried to nudge me towards doing something like law or medicine. And I think fortunately pretty early on in my like high school, uh, experience, like probably when I was in year 11, I was like, that isn't the path for me. I just know what I love to do. Mm -hmm. I would like use my lunch times to go and like paint in the art rooms. So I, I knew and I love design. Uh, so I, I sort of started to understand that that was going to be my future. What was the transition like growing up on a farm and then you went to a all-girls boarding school in Sydney? What age did you go? I was 12 when I went. What was that like? Uh, amazing. I like couldn't wait to go. I had a little countdown calendar when I was in year six of like days until I got to go to boarding school. (laughs) Yeah. And the first couple of years you sleep in an open dorm. So it's like you and like 16 other girls in one big room. And so it's sort of like a young girl's dream come true. Just like sleep over every single night, go down to school, you eat dinner together, you go like hang out on weekends together. Yeah. Just super, super close with people. Did you have any jobs in high school? We weren't allowed to work as boarders because, you know, we had to be somewhat trapped Mm. on the the campus. But the one job you could have was a swimming instructor at at the pool. The pool would do um, like little kids swimming lessons. And so I, as soon as I could, like got my like swimming teaching license and worked doing that. And they paid you? Yeah, that's pretty good. It, well, like I didn't love it, but like, <laughs> that was like, yeah, the one job that I could have. So I was like, I'm going to try and do this. Okay. And then through school, you're trying to work out what you're going to do when you're older. I feel like you're kind of being told by career counsellors, here are the options. You're naturally just gravitating back towards probably what your soul loves, which is this creating and designing. So what did you do at uni? What happened after school? Yeah. So I did a Bachelor of Design at UNSW. Um, well, first of all, I did a gap year. And while I was on my gap year, I was like, oh, I got really into fashion uh, and fashion design and making my own clothes. And I was like, maybe I want to apply to do fashion. But at that point in time, I was a mature student, which doesn't make any sense. But I remember while I was in my gap year making this like epic portfolio of to try and get into fashion at UTS. 
uh, and I didn't get in. And I was like devastated at the time, but I'd already gotten into design at UNSW. So I was like, that's, that's what I'll do. And like in hindsight, very glad I didn't go down the fashion path. I think it's extremely difficult and competitive to build a career in fashion. And there's like a, yeah, there's a ceiling to how much you can do and how much you can earn. So uh, yeah, Bachelor of Design at UNSW was the path. And what was your first proper job? Like, did that degree set you up? Do you think it was worthwhile doing that? What happened next? Mm. Yeah, my first proper job was directly after I graduated. I was a marketing designer, uh, or really, yeah, designer and marketing team at a luxury furniture retailer, Coco Republic in Sydney. Uh, and I had to do a certain number of like intern hours to complete my degree. And so I saw this as like, a, oh, I'll just get to check off these internship hours and I'll get paid for them. Like, that's amazing. So many of my other friends from my, my course were doing like unpaid internships. Uh, I, I don't think it was like what I saw as my first ideal job, to be honest. Like some of my friends were working at design agencies and like branding agencies. And I was like, oh, that would be way cooler. But uh, what it did enable me to do was like build a really awesome and beautiful portfolio and yeah, work in a like fairly professional team um, and work on like photography, styling, a, a bunch of different things that I'd never done before. Uh, but it was mostly just being armed with a really stunning portfolio because the brand Coco Republic is beautiful and all the furniture is beautiful. So by the time I went to get my next job, I had something impressive behind me. What was the next job? The next job was Hinge. Okay, so yeah. this is all in Australia. Then what makes you move to America? And what year was it? This is uh, 2015, but we were prepping. So my, uh, my partner at the time and I, he had just gotten back from a trip, six months traveling around the States, and he loved it. And I'd never been before. And he gets back and he's like, Lucy, you would love New York. Like, I love New York you know, we should think about going. We knew that within a year of graduating as Australians, you were eligible for this J-1 visa, um, which meant that you could go to the States without having a job lined up and you could, uh, yeah, see what you could find in for a year you could work. And so we were like, okay, our time is like running out to apply for this this visa. So we're like, let's go. Um, I'd never been to the States before. I'd never been to New York before, but like I'd lived in other countries. So it wasn't, it was like kind of a YOLO moment, but I also knew that I like loved doing that, just like uprooting my life and, and going somewhere else. What made you love doing that? It seems quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. I don't know. I, I think, I mean, you know, when I went to boarding school from such a young age, it was that like, um, part of it is novelty seeking, I guess. Mm. Like it just feels really good to be somewhere else and like be faced with the challenge of like, okay, I got to make friends. I got to figure out money. I've got to figure out how I'm going to live and like adjust to this whole new culture of a place. Um, and I'd done it. I did it on my gap year. I did it when I went on exchange. And so I was like, okay, well, I've never done it in the States before. So You've done it like four or five times. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Keep going. Um, <laughs> So, and I think there was just a, a desire at that time. I'd spent a couple of years in Sydney and there was a, a need for a new adventure, like a, I'm ready for a, a new challenge. And so we, we went in March of 2015 and we arrived. It was snowy and freaking so cold. Uh, and it was like tough for the first couple of months. Like we knew one person in New York and we had like a small amount of savings to get us by. I probably could survive there for three months without getting a job. Mm -hmm. Did you have a plan or anything or you just knew I've got three months worth of money? I'll just, I've, did you feel like you had nothing really to lose? I'll just give it a go. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't even really have my portfolio together. So when I arrived, I remember like going and like hanging in cafes for entire days, just like making my portfolio and sending it off to literally any like junior design role that I could find in New York. And I interviewed, yeah, I interviewed at a decent number of places and wasn't so excited by the people I was interviewing with or the, the products and the brands I was interviewing with, but. Were you getting offers? Uh, I wasn't getting offers, but I was getting like callbacks. Mm -hmm. I was getting like, hey, let's do a second interview. So I was like deep in the process with like yeah. multiple people at the same time. And, uh, I had dinner with the one friend that, that we knew 
And I was explaining to her, like, I'm not really getting anywhere. I think I'd been there for like six weeks at that point in time. Were you worried? Uh, a little bit. Like my, my like small pocket of savings was dwindling. And, but, I, but I also knew that like the backup was, oh, I'd started nannying to like also generate cash. Mm-hmm. So the backup was always like I could babysit. I had a lot of experience as a nanny from Sydney. Um, and so there was always a, a fallback. My boyfriend had gotten a... a job at the Australian which is an Australian bar and so like he was okay and yeah I got dinner with this friend and uh she was like you should work at a startup had you heard of a startup like not really <laughs> yeah <laughs> what did you think I was like, she cool. meant? like <laughs> <laughs> sounds interesting yeah it does I like knew nothing about the tech industry it's actually kind of crazy now that I'm in it so deep but like you know I was using apps on my phone I used so much different forms of technology but never deeply thought about how that software was created and so she's like go on angel list which is this platform that uh where where people in in tech or who want to work in tech go and and find jobs and so i did and that's when i saw a junior marketing designer role at hinge never heard of hinge before it was uh still like quite a new and small dating app but i remember like looking at their website and their team page. They just had like all these awesome photos of their team doing activities. And like they had a lot of, (laughs) they had a lot of emphasis on the culture. So it was very appealing. And I applied and Karen, who was the VP of marketing at the time, uh, called me up and asked me if I knew how to do various things. One of which was uh, coding HTML emails. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I know how to do all of that. Um, You've never done it? Mm-mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you kind of have to do these things yeah. at, at some point. It you'll was figure like, it out. It was trust you'll figure it out. Right. It was like mostly a design role, but they it, it's a startup. So they want you to be a little bit of a jack of all trades because they can't, you know, afford to hire for every distinct role. Yeah. Um, and so went in for a first interview. It went really well. They sent me some homework. One of one piece of which was design homework, one piece of which was some coding homework. Um, <laughs> what did you do with the coding homework? Did you give it to a friend? <laughs> I mean, I've actually, ne- I've actually never admitted this to anybody at Hinge because I'm like worried at me. <laughs> oh, it's all right. You're long gone now. <laughs> I am long gone now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I got my friend Pravesh from Coco Republic, who is this brilliant guy who knew how to code, to, to do the HTML part of the homework. That's amazing. <laughs> And, you know, like managed to have this email coded together and I sent it through to them and they were like, great, that's awesome. Come in for the next rounds. The next rounds were like five different interviews or four different interviews back to back in one day. What if they asked you to code HTML live? Did that cross your mind? Uh, No, (laughs) but it did cross my mind that I was going to have to do it on the job. (laughs) (laughs) Which I did have to. I literally (laughs) did have to learn it and it was pretty rough and Mm. like pretty, pretty slow. Uh, to get going. What were the other five interviews like? Uh, they were like, they were intense. Like everyone at Hinge is very smart and very on the ball. And they had like a pretty good idea of what they needed. Um, but I think what worked to my advantage, they proposed a lot of like hypotheticals to me. Like if you were going to do a photo shoot for this particular campaign, like how would you think about it? Or if you were going to design this particular campaign, Um, And I think I kind of knew just like intuitively some of the problems with design and dating apps, like especially when it comes to photography, you can't, it's very easy to make things look cringe. Mm. Like photographing a couple, it's very easy for that to just be like so on the nose and off-putting to people. And so I spoke to that and I think they were like, oh yeah, she gets it. Mm. And I think that's like part of the reason why they hired me. What was the state of Hinge like when you joined? Like where was it in the market and in its, I guess, lifetime? Yeah, they Hinge had gone through like, even at that point, a couple of different iterations. It started as a Facebook app um, and then they built like some sort of web app and then they had just uh, maybe over the last year built their first mobile apps like iOS and Android. Um, they had a pretty good foothold in New York and San Francisco and LA, and they'd just done a tour of launches. Their whole strategy was like do market specific launches um, to like seed the first couple of users in each market. And I think we might have had like 200,000 users. Yep. Uh, I can't remember if that was total or monthly actives. It might have been around 200 monthly active users. So it was like, Not small, like, and they'd just done a Series A. They'd raised a $20 million Series A. Um, So it was not small. 
but it was, uh, yeah, they hadn't really like exploded yet. How many employees did they have at that point? There were about 20. I think okay. it might have been 20 or 21. Okay. And yeah. you were going into a team working with a, was there a design lead then? There was one other designer. He was a product designer. Okay. So mostly working on the product team. And they needed me because he was, I think, tired of having to do all the social designs, the email designs, all of that stuff. And so uh, I did have some like guidance and, and help from him, but it was mostly like trying to figure out like how our brand was going to look. And we did one of my first projects was like setting up, redoing the website on Squarespace, which was like quite basic, you know, <laughs> taking a Squarespace template. Yeah. <laughs> how did it feel working at Hinge? Mm. Uh, awesome. I think from the very beginning, I was like, holy shit, like what have I stepped into? Uh, everyone, I'd just never been part of a team that was so focused, so energized, so hilarious, to be honest. Like they'd really picked people well and the personalities well so that everybody jived very well together. Um, and everyone was so intelligent. I was like, wow. And the way that they would like analyze situations or like creatively generate ideas. I just remember being in the boardroom that we had in our office doing these sessions where we'd like try and move a particular concept forward. And I just honestly was like blown away by the caliber of the people and the sorts of people I was in this room with. So you walked in and you're, uh, you're lying about HTML <laughs> emails and you're doing marketing and Squarespace and then you end up becoming the lead designer at Hinge. How did that happen? Yeah, so about nine months after I started, our CEO, Justin, he went away for Thanksgiving and he came back and I wasn't really privy to a lot of our like business problems and product problems and analytics at the time, but he certainly was. And he knew that we weren't really growing fast enough. And we, he, he came back from that break and he was like, we are not differentiated enough in our market and we're not going to win unless we differentiate our brand, our product, and we build for like a segment of the market that like really, really needs a product like Hinge or really has an unaddressed need. Um, and so he actually like let go of some people on the team, uh, I think some like Android engineers, some of the marketing team and got it down to like a really bare bones team. And he's like, we're going to rebuild Hinge from scratch and we're going to uh, like redo the product, redo the brand and try and build something that is really differentiated and like really serves. It was specifically women who were looking for relationships. That was the group that would identified like were sort of most desperate for a product that really spoke to like, their particular like sensibilities and, and needs. Uh, and I think it was at that point, we didn't, we weren't doing, there was a pause on marketing spend. And so Justin was like, I need you to start working on product design. And that was like where all the emphasis was at the time. And so it was like thrust into a room um, with Alok, the other designer, and just like lots of wireframing, lots of like trying to figure out what this new hinge was going to look like. It was like probably one of the most exciting times of my career. Um, we did lots of hackathons as a team to try and like ideate and come up with like all the different permutations of what new hinge could look like. Um, but it was also being thrown in the deep end. Like I had no idea about all the conventions and the patterns with like UX UI design. And so at the time I was making really like dumb suggestions to be honest. And there was like a low bless him was like very patient with me. Um, and then a local left after a couple of months and I was the only designer on the team. And so I'd like learned enough to get to the point where I, I could do it and I could lead it. But still there was like lots of mistakes that I made and like made publicly like in production. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's one of the things with startups is like, same with my experience. I made so many mistakes, but I never got in trouble. Like I was never reprimanded and some of those mistakes cost the company quite a bit of money and it was like no worries just don't do it again right and you kind of learn and just keep going and really have to be able to roll with the punches did any of your errors like stick with you like do you feel like you would just move on and on to the next or would it kind of weigh on you a bit mm, nothing ever weighed on me because I mean, design and the product development is such an iterative process and you're constantly making changes and optimizations to get to this like perfect, ideally perfect end state. And so I just don't think you can get caught up on like, oh, that was the wrong thing, you know, back in 2015. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and also like everything, when you're a designer on the team, you have a PM and like Justin also, the CEO was very, very involved in the development process at that time. So like all the designs were reviewed, everyone was bought into, okay, this is what the engineers are going to code up right now. This is how it looks. So it wasn't just me being like the final decision. Yeah. Everyone like cast their eyes over these designs and like made a lot of suggestions and a lot was changed. So it wasn't like, I didn't feel the sole, you know, weight of the responsibility. What was it like working with Justin? Uh, it was really good. I, I loved working with Justin. He um, he is a very intense person. And so, like, there was a certain, like, adjusting to the way that he would, like, make suggestions. Like, if he was really passionate about something, um, it honestly was so energizing and like he really had this crazy ability to like get the team to rally around working on something or working really hard on a particular direction or a particular concept and so it was sort of like in some ways like intoxicating being like by his side trying to mm. figure this stuff out just because of like this force and this like positive brute force that he had um he also is uh he has a very good attunement to like when things are going wrong or when things are going right. I think he has very good intuition around our market, around product, around design. I think that's why he like really pushed us on product design and on brand so much because he is, his standards for like what the product should look like and feel like and do were so high. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was really cool like working around someone who like pushed you that much. What's your fondest memory of working at Hinge? Oh man. <laughs> so many but I, I think one that I like often think back to just because it was like uh I don't know a culmination of like a lot of the things that I love but as we were prepping to launch the the new version of Hinge this is like um it would have been like September 2015 we uh wanted to do like mass user testing session to get as much feedback as we possibly could and to get our community and our users like really bought into this new thing that we were about to like introduce to them so we like rented out the top floor of a hotel in manhattan and we invited hundreds of hinge users and we all got like so many test phones and we were sat like set up in a room with all these test phones with like the new version of Hinge on it and all these questions that we were going to ask. And like everyone had these drinks and it was this like mad fun social event and like people filtered through and we like sat down with everybody and like showed them the new UI and like got feedback on it. And I just think it was a really cool way to do user testing. And it was just like really fun and a, a beautiful community moment for our brand and for our team. What was the toughest moment at Hinge? Mm. Uh, uh, maybe like off, like directly <laughs> after we launched the new version and it was just not it. It was, uh, and we'd done, a, you know, a decent amount of A-B testing, but like you can never fully be confident. Mm. Um, and it just like wasn't, some of our assumptions were so wrong and it wasn't adopted and it wasn't used in the way that we thought it would be. And I think, um, yeah, we'd spent a lot of money on press. We'd spent a lot of money doing this like, like big launch animation video. And like, I think none of that really mattered because like the product just like wasn't well set up to capture and retain mm. all of these users that we were, you know, pulling in with our hype. What was one of the main assumptions that you got wrong? Uh, that... People who are very intentioned with their dating life will want to pay for a dating app just simply to use it. We put a $7 paywall in the onboarding flow. You couldn't even go in and like see what the product was about. And the idea was like, if everybody pays, the people who pay are most serious. They're going to be serious daters. Yep. So you're going to like weed out the people who are just like not going to reply and are, are not taking it seriously. But it just weeded out everyone. They just weeded out everyone. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to pay for a dating app. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So switching gears again now. You've been working at Hinge. You're in this huge role. Obviously, it becomes this household name. And I would say it's probably like peaking and you decide to leave. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, it was a really hard decision. I deliberated, I deliberated leaving, I'm gonna say for about a year. Mm -hmm. It was on my mind and my poor roommates, by the end of that year, they were just like, 
Mort, you got to go. Like, <laughs> yeah. you got to stop, like, talking about potentially leaving. But I think it was really hard because I could see this amazing trajectory, this incredible trajectory the brand was on, the product was on. And so, like, I think it was hard to, like, you know, jump off a horse that was that was winning and was, was working. Uh, but I was feeling, like, creatively spent. I think I'd worked on the same brand and the same product for a number of years at that point. And I, I think it just like simply wasn't bringing me the same joy that it was. But I also felt like everything had been figured out for the most part. We'd figured out the brand. Mm-hmm. We'd done two different rebrands. We'd done so much iterating on the product and it was actually working. So I was like a little like starved of like real problem solving and like, you know, zero to one, we need to build this from scratch. Like, I think that's what I find found most satisfying about the process and then when we just started to grow and I at that point was design director and so I was just managing people there was a lot of like coaching like doing the logistics involved with running the team and doing photo shoots and stuff like that and it wasn't um yeah it wasn't making my heart sing did you feel judged by anyone for leaving uh a little bit I think I think I felt like people thought it was a dumb move because I left like so much equity on the table and everybody, all my peers and Justin were all going to like stay for the next couple of years to like vest all of their, all of their equity. And there, I think people were just perplexed. They were like, why would she, why would she leave this? But I really like was not in a great space mentally at the time. And I knew I had to make a change and I knew I had to, I, I, yeah, I was like really worried about what might happen if I stayed there to my mm. mind and to my soul. Mm. I know that sounds dramatic. You chose mind like... over money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, whilst you were at Hinge, what did the rest of your life look like? Uh, it, on- <laughs> it honestly was also taken up by Hinge. So I lived with people at Hinge that I met there. <laughs> How many? Uh, there were two other people that worked at Hinge that were in my house. I shared a room with my boyfriend and then there was one other friend. Um, so there were five of us in this house in Williamsburg. And we were friends with a lot of the people that we worked with. Again, because I think they just picked people really well and we were all like in our mid-20s and like living this very intense New York lifestyle. Um, so there was... Uh, a lot, like a lot of going out, a lot of going to parties, a lot of dancing, a lot of like having people over to our house. Our house was like the hub of the friend group and we had this big backyard. So, so fun. People were it, like every Friday night, every Saturday night was our, our house was the spot. Do you think Justin slash Hinge had a secret around how to find people and bring them together like that and how to create that kind of culture? Mm. I don't think they'd been able to unpack it in the beginning. I think it was, uh, they had a pretty good intuition around like, oh, this person has certain like a certain openness or yeah, certain qualities that would mean that they're going to like make friends here. I, I think like Justin and the leadership team like probably liked that we had this house and that we were like forming friend groups, you know, together outside of work. Mm. Um, because it just, I think it probably like added to the culture as well. Were there ever moments at Hinge or in Hinge's lifetime where it seemed like it wasn't going to work? Uh, yes. Yeah. There was a time before me uh, where I think they had like, a f- they, had a, they had a handful of users maybe in like a a small number of markets, but like things weren't really growing and they had $25,000 left in the bank. So the story goes. (laughs) And so Justin knew that they had to have a sort of like hail Mary moment where they were just tried to do something with the last cash because they had this product um, and they wanted to, I think it was when they just were about to release the first version of the iOS app and uh, they had it, they decided to have a party, they decided to have a huge like 3,000 person party in DC, rented out this huge space, spent all, you know, all the last money on that. Um, apparently the night before the party that like Apple still hadn't approved oh the my God. iOS app that they were like going to be launching to this party. Um, 
and they'd been struggling to fundraise, I think. So they really like, they weren't going to be able to raise money unless this launch went really well. So there's just like so much hinging on this. Anyways. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they pulled some strings with somebody at Apple and like got the thing expedited. So it was ready to go. And all the 3000 like single young people in DC came to this party and it went off apparently. And everybody had to download Hinge when they came in. And over the next couple of days, there was like all these matching and all this, all these likes and enough that generated enough traction for them to be able to raise more money and keep building the company. Incredible. Were there any other moments where you just noticed the trajectory switch or like a really big uptick? And can you remember what drove that? Mm. I mean, one of the biggest upticks was getting acquired by Match Group and just like having all their their marketing budget. Mm. Like we, because we had um, like raised venture capital and we weren't, um, yeah, we, we had to be like very careful with our marketing spend and it like costs a decent amount to acquire users for dating apps. And so it was really when like they acquired us and we did our first like proper ad campaigns where we put a lot of spend behind. This is when we developed Hingy and designed to be deleted. So it was around that time that like things really started to take off. But before that, I think it was a lot of like, uh, we did some like changes to the algorithm that I think changes the trajectory of, of Hinge around like 2017. I think we were, we released those changes. Um, and that just meant that like people were seeing more people that they were attracted to and that they liked. And so the product literally became better. But I think the growth re- was like fairly linear for a period of time when we were iterating. Like things were definitely getting better, mm. but it was like a series of small changes that, that led to it. Were employees aware of how much money Hinge had in the bank or was that something that was kept confidential? That was kept confidential. But they knew how much had been raised? We knew how much had been raised. We had no idea how much we were burning. Mm -hmm. We had no idea when our, like, cash out date was. I think we just started to get, like, little inklings or pick up on little clues that we were fundraising. Um, And I think when you know that you're fundraising but you're not hearing any news about, like, the outcome of the fundraise, yeah, you – yeah, you start to become worried as an employee. So there's definitely a period around like late 2017, early 2018 when like we knew that we were coming, running out of cash because like the the Series A happened at the end of 2014. And so mm. really like it was like four years or three and a half years worth of worth of cash. And we were like worried, like we would come home at, at night and like debrief at our place and be like, yeah, do we need to look for other jobs? <laughs> yeah, it makes you definitely understand why as a founder you probably shouldn't tell everyone we're raising because then the next question is how did it go and also even if you've got the money it can still be months before that money is actually in the bank so you kind of have to keep it close to your to your chest yeah so you leave hinge and you're really to take care of yourself and did you have a plan when you left hinge about what was going to come next Honestly, no, I was pretty burnt out and I just and needed to. And when was to, this? This is June of uh, 2019. And actually I didn't fully leave. Justin, like when I tried to resign, I like broke down in tears in front of him. And I think he could just, and we took a long walk around Washington Park. And I think he could just tell that like I was making this decision from a place of like o- almost like pain. And so he's like, take some time off, uh, take three months um, take a sabbatical and then like at the end of it let me know if you really want to leave or if or if you want to keep doing this um, which was such a gift mm. uh, and so I went to Mexico um, and like solo traveled for the first time in my life I went for like two months maybe and honestly just like read a lot of books like partied a lot met a lot of people <laughs> just, I really just had to do nothing I laid on yeah. the beach a lot I, I had to like heal in a weird way from this very intense like New York startup life. And uh, I started working. It, it, after about a month, I started working on an idea, which was like not the way that you generate ideas, like alone on a beach in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Note to sell. <laughs> Note to sell. But, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but like I had this vague idea, this vague sense that I wanted to start a company. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to start like creating stuff. And like I'm, I'm good at design. So like my solution or like what I started to do was just like – fiddle around with things in Figma and like fiddle around with different ideas. When I came back to New York, 
after my two months traveling, I was like, I had the fully fleshed out designs for this product. Mm. And what was it? It was an app that was going to help you make uh, social plans with your friends. Mm -hmm. It was sort of in lieu of Facebook events. Facebook Mm -hmm. events had died. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and like find other communities and like thing events around the city that you wanted to, to, to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, I've since realized so many people like work on ideas like this because it's like one of the most like, you know, immediately obvious things that you could do. Yeah. Um, But don't discredit yourself like that. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. um, So (laughs) thank you. Uh, And like I took it through Y Y Combinator and like applied there and they, they gave me an interview, bless them, for this idea and didn't get through and they literally told me, um, so many people have, have tried this before and like, this is a really difficult business to, to build, go and like talk to founders that have, uh, like tried to, to work on something like this. And that was like the best advice that mm. I could have received at that time. So I literally hit up all these ex founders or some of them are current founders on LinkedIn and got them on calls with me and asked them a series of questions about like what it was like to build a product like this and like what the market was like. And they were all so burnt out and so jaded on the space. Mm. And so just like some, a lot of them had left. Um, but like, there was a lot of pessimism and I was like this, yeah, I don't think I want to work on this idea anymore. That's such a good thing to have done though. Like that's such great advice. Can you tell people, cause I feel like a lot of people wouldn't actually know what Y Combinator is and I suppose how, what's the word I'm looking for? It's quite an elite thing to go through. And a lot of people see great success off the back of it. Can you just explain what it is and how you knew about it? It's an accelerator for, um, it's probably, yeah, the most famous like startup accelerator in the world. And uh, it's in San Francisco, although I think you can do it remotely. And like some of the, the biggest companies in the world, like Airbnb and Dropbox, have gone through uh, Y Combinator, that's where they started. And so they have a really good brand name. They're really good at like helping you develop your idea and helping you build an MVP and helping you raise money. And so if you can get into YC, like you're fairly well set up to have at least the first part of your journey, like just very supported. So uh, I really, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to get in there. I thought, I thought that made like the most sense as somebody who like didn't really have a big community, a big like, tech community around me I hadn't like networked a lot to be honest while I was at Hinge so I I met an engineer in New York and like we went and and did this together uh yeah what came after that what came after the calls with jaded founders (laughs) (laughs) uh a period of feeling like um you know a bit embarrassed I suppose like I had told all my friends that I was doing this Mm. I had like done all this research with my friends and Uh, I think that was another lesson for me too, like just not to scream off the rooftops about your idea until you are actually so set in stone and you're going to do it. Um, Yeah, I don't know like where I sit on that now, but like I I think I did feel a a bit embarrassed at the time and I just had to take some time to um, figure out what I was going to do next. That's probably when some regret hit me. I was like, I shouldn't have left Hinge. That was a dumb decision. I... Um, yeah, like now, like, what am I doing now? I thought I was going to do like some startup and I like, don't know if I'm like good enough to do this. I don't know if my ideas are good. Mm. Was this now into 2020 as well? Was the pandemic hitting? This is like the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. And so I actually went back to Australia for, I had to renew my visa for a couple of months at the end of the year. And I, yeah, it was good time spent with my family, but I really had no idea what the fuck I was going to do when I came back. Um, and I just started working on other ideas. I started exploring other things that I was interested in. And I just started, ne- like I started writing a sub stack and like tweeting about the stuff that I was writing about. And I think that was huge because it was like the most natural way of networking. Other people that like liked the ideas I was talking about would hit me up and then I would do a call with them. And then they'd be like, oh, so-and-so is kind of interested in that too. You should meet them. Mm. And then that's kind of how I stumbled into On Deck. Um, people like knew that I was going through this kind of like exploring different things that I was interested in to, to try and build something. And they're like, you should join on deck. What is on deck? It is a, a fellowship um, for, or a community for people who want to start companies, want to start tech, tech companies. And what was it like getting in there? Uh, it was awesome. Yeah. It was like, uh, you have different cohorts and in my cohort, there were a lot of software engineers, a lot of PMs, some designers, though not a a lot of designers. Uh, 
And it was all people like their entry criteria is you have to have, you know, started in your career or in, in some way you have to have done something mm-hmm. prolific or something major. Cause the idea was to bring people together who could like co-found companies yep. and there could just be this like amazing sparking of ideas. And it really was like that, but they had all these workshops where they taught you like how to generate ideas for startups, how to validate ideas for startups, how to like um, do user research correctly, how to like, you know, mock up your ideas, how to like hire software engineers, how to vet your co-founder that you might want to, you know, build a company with. So there was a great, can you tell people about that task, the (laughs) quiz? Yeah, there was a co-founder questionnaire that um, Michelle and I did. Uh, it's like 75 questions it it was it was a lot and they really got into I think you just want to make sure that you have like similar values or the same values or the same attitudes around your ambition or money or people um and yeah I think it was very good and valuable that we did that questionnaire Mm. so it was like on deck was like a crash course well not really crash course quite an in-depth course on like everything you would need to essentially know to get a startup off the ground it was 10 weeks and then there were also hackathons so you would get placed in teams and you'd have like a weekend to like work on an idea around a certain theme or or completely open and then like present what you built at the end of the weekend and like that was the first time I'd ever participated in a hackathon Mm. it was so fun what were some of the ideas bubbling away whilst you were out on deck Mm. Well, I came into On Deck wanting to build a, like a, a collage app for, for teens. I like noticed this like phenomenon happening on, uh, on Pinterest a little bit, but also on Instagram where like high school girls specifically would make these like different themed collages, like a cottage core collage or like a dark academia collage. And there was just this whole little like subculture on collages. But like they were having to do it also manually. And so I did like, you know, I stepped into that world for a second because I was like, this would be fun. This yeah. is like a nice combination of like technology and art. And it's like really expressive. It's taking me back to you on the farm. <laughs> Everything's just tying together. It's arts and crafts in the field. Yeah, it is, it is arts and crafts. And, and it was like kind of cool. It was like very playful and like doing user interviews with like 14 year olds who sit in their bedroom mm. and making these collages it was very, very sweet. Um, and I started working on that idea. Like I found somebody, found two people in on deck, an engineer and a PM, and we started working on that. We didn't work so well together, to be honest. Um, and Did so you I, do the questionnaire? We didn't do the questionnaire. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. And, and I think <laughs> we, yeah, we probably just jumped into it way too quickly, but that you kind of just have to, you have to start working on something and like try out working together. And if it works great and if it doesn't, you just need to change course. But mm. it does, you know, there's definitely some awkward conversations and all of that. Like, mm. hey, you know, having to do these little micro breakups. Mm. What, when was this in the timeline? This is like uh, July, August, 2020. Yep. Okay. And what comes next after the collage? <laughs> <laughs> well, a bunch of us from uh, On Deck decided that it would be great that if we could meet each other, this is like during the pandemic and we'd all been doing this fellowship virtually. And so we rented a huge house in Tulum in Mexico and we went down there with the idea was to stay for a month and to just like work on stuff together. Um, and so that's what I did in September. I like packed up my room in New York, uh, didn't know when I was going to, to be back. And yeah, the house was very interesting. I would say half of the people in the house were like very dedicated to starting a company and like very there to seriously work. And at the time I was also doing like contract work because I was having to like generate money for myself to live. Yeah. So I'd sort of like spend half the day like working on these these projects for other companies and then the other half like working on the stuff that I might want to do. And and then the other half of the people in the house just I think were there for a good time. And they <laughs> <laughs> which did like yeah there was a little bit of tension and then like uh, a bunch of us including myself got COVID in the house <laughs> and, and, it wouldn't and, be right if you hadn't have got COVID yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so yeah the, ha- the house sort of like fell apart towards the end and like a few of us decided to stay there and rent a different place and I ended up being in Tulum for, for three months which was awesome because uh, yeah, COVID wasn't very policed in um, Tulum at the time. So like you could still go and like live normally, basically. Mm. Okay. And then what ideas were starting to stick with you? Were you still in Mexico? Where was your career heading? <laughs> I was definitely getting worried because like my personal financial runway was like dissipating quickly. And I think I just had, at this point in time, I'd been like away for out of 
hinge for like a year, more than a year, year and a half. And so I was just like so antsy to do something. I was so antsy to like, not that I was fucking around. It was like necessary fucking around. Mm. But the fucking around and finding out, I felt like I wanted it to come to an end. And I had one of the ideas I was working on was a sex positive dating app. Um, and cause I could see like, uh, I guess everybody's attitudes in the world, like changing towards sex and towards their, like expressing their sexual preferences, their gender, their gender identities. And I knew that there wasn't a, a product in the market to like solve th that particular need or, or, or build for those particular people. Um, I then like got cold feet again. Cause I was like, do I really want to work on a dating product? They're really hard. They're really hard to scale. They're honestly like so hard to make money from. Mm. Um, and, uh, it was around that time that I, uh, only fans blew up mm. and I got, I, yeah, I started using only fans. I was like, what is this product? This is so fascinating. Um, and the more time I spent on it, the more I was like, wow, this category is kind of like the perfect combination of like a lot of my interests. It is, um, a place where like intimacy and like closeness is exchanged. And like, that's the currency. Mm. It is a place where people are really creative and expressive. It is, uh, a place where sex positivity and body positivity is celebrated. And so, yeah, I just became really obsessed with figuring out how it worked and figuring mm. out how people were making money and figuring out like the, the future of the market and like where things were heading and like where, 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 what the trends were. Mm. And you started using it to dive into that. Yeah. Yeah. I started a creator account. <laughs> I didn't get many subscribers to be honest, Honestly, because I was scared of promoting it. I'd mm. like, I remember including the link at the very bottom of one of my Substack <laughs> articles, like, oh my God, this is such a risk. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's part of what I became very familiar with was that stigma and that fear of, of being judged or being caught doing this. Mm. Um, but it was fascinating. And I think just like this, the flip that switched in my head was like, oh, it actually isn't bad to receive money for a nude it actually feels amazing. And the people that are like um, subscribing to my account and like tipping me and stuff, like were so complimentary. It was mm. an ego boost, to be honest. They were like, you're so beautiful. And I was like, wow, not only am I getting money, but you're like showering me in these compliments. Mm. Uh, this is not the like dirty, grimy world that like it, you know, was made out to be by honestly most of society. Mm. And then where were your thoughts taking you? Did you start speaking to other people on OnlyFans? Did you start exploring the whole space? Yeah, I did a lot of uh, user interviews. I think I like go into a bit of like a formal process when I'm like really interested in pursuing maybe an idea or like a problem space. And so, yeah, I like pretty methodically like got people on the phone and like did calls with people and just tried to understand like what was working for them, what they loved about OnlyFans, what they hated about OnlyFans. Uh, and then I moved on to people who like had thought of, thought about using OnlyFans, but were kind of on the fence. Um, and like, why? W like, what? What the? What was the apprehension? What was the fear? Like, what? What would it take for you to like want to do this? Um, yeah. What were you learning? Uh, I was learning that the women that were on OnlyFans, they like detested the brand, the OnlyFans brand. They just felt so. Um, uncared for I suppose or not they, they didn't feel listened to they didn't feel heard there I've, I've since realized that OnlyFans in the early days didn't have a customer support team they mm. literally didn't have a customer support team as they were blowing up during the pandemic so like if you had a problem if you didn't get a payout if like somebody had said something you know done something disgusting to you like you had no there was no recourse mm. and so these creators were just like fuck OnlyFans that was the feeling and I think Bella Thorne had just come onto OnlyFans and caused all these issues with um, with chargebacks and refunds. And so OnlyFans placed all these limits on the amount of tips you could receive or the, the, uh, the amount of a tip you could receive. And there was just, yeah, the most of the OnlyFans creators hated that, even though I know that it like would have helped their earnings because it like bolstered the brand. It like added so much brand awareness to OnlyFans. Mm. Um, and then I think on the, the other side, the people who were on the fence about OnlyFans, there was like, a, just like, a, uh, I, I don't want my family and friends to find out about mm. this. I like, I, I want the money. I'm like very intrigued about this. And these are often like sex positive, body positive people, but mm. like, just like a tep 
trepidation. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what might happen to my career. I, you know, want to achieve these certain things. I'm worried about my internet history, my post mm. history. Would you say your use of the product and all this early exploration work was just continuing to build your curiosity on the space and like potentially bring ideas of what you could work on in a similar zone? Definitely. Like the, the, <laughs> the biggest thought was like, ah, oh, this, this, this product like seems like trash and the brand seems like trash. No offense, only offense. So they've done a great job of like improving things over the years for yeah. sure. Yeah. But at the time I was like, they have put zero effort into their branding, like thinking about their positioning, their visual ID, uh, their tone of voice. Mm. What they were saying publicly was just all so wrong. Mm. Um, and the product itself just felt like so basic and so clunky. Mm. But it was work. But it, yeah, but it was working for you know, a certain demographic. Mm. So I, I think that's what like got me really excited. Was like there are so many things that they haven't done correctly here, and there is like a huge segment of the market that they can't capture because of their brand and because of the way the product is structured. Okay, changing gears, we're going to have a little tradition in our episodes somewhat related to the Sunroom app, where we have the daily question. So we'll be asking each other a question that is. You shouldn't ask that. It's just off limits. My question for you is, it's not so much my questions off limits, it's just your answer might be. So I'm really <laughs> flipping it here. But one of the things I love about you most is that you are a bit of a party girl and I think you have a little dark streak inside you, which I love. So what is your wildest party story? Oh, man. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to pick. <laughs> uh, you can be a party girl and still be taken seriously as well. Okay, that's what we're proving. <laughs> uh, it was probably um, it was splendor in the grass. <laughs> Uh, the year might have been like 2013 or something. <laughs> it was my... It's really throwing it back. <laughs> my boyfriend at the time, uh, it was his birthday and it was like the third day of the festival. But it was like, you know, we were going to go hard because it was his birthday. And yeah. we were there with all of our friends. And we were like lining up at a bar to get drinks. And uh, he found like a packet of, of drugs on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> And we, unknown substance. Un, unknown yeah. substance. <laughs> and we were like 22 or 23, like definitely in like more of like a risk taking like phase of our lives, yeah. I would say. But it looked it looked like Molly. It looked like MDMA. And so we were like, we know this drug. Like, You're like, we've hit the jackpot. <laughs> yeah, yeah <we're> the, <laughs> this is amazing. Just like free drugs. And so, yeah, my boyfriend and I split this, this packet of drugs that we found on the, on the floor. And um, it was not Molly. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it was like, I can't even, to this day, I don't know what it was. Unidentified. Unidentified, but it was like the most insane trip I have ever had in my life. Everybody at the festival looked like little green aliens <laughs> bopping around. I am not even kidding you. And it was like that for hours. <laughs> and like, I mean, I have to think it was fun. I think we were having fun, but I was like, this is insane. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and we didn't sleep for a very long time. Oh my God. Little green aliens. Okay. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> That's a wrap. Um, okay. Lucy, one last question. Yeah. So for everyone, anyone who wants to know more about you, where can they find you? Uh, on my sunroom account is where I go the most deep, but also on Twitter and on Instagram and on TikTok. And is your handle Lucy Moore across the board? No, it's not. It's different on each one. I think it's like Lucy underscore Mort on Instagram. It's Lucy Mort on Sunroom. It's Lucy Mort underscore on uh, Twitter. Amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that is a wrap. Ep one. Woohoo. Thanks for joining us on Try Babies. <laughs>
Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode. A quick ask if you enjoyed listening, it would mean the world if you could jump on Spotify or Apple and review the podcast. Five stars only, please. We need to build that army so we can read what you loved and what you want to hear more of. We're so grateful to have such an incredible community of empowered, motivated and confident women supporting each other here to go after their dreams. That's what we've needed most throughout our journey. You can subscribe so you don't miss our episodes or head over to our Try Babies podcast Facebook group and try babies insta where we can connect with you more and ask us questions that you want answered in the show see you on the next episode of try babies